This is America's first freeway. A cruising and zooming high-speed road just for cars. Not a radical idea today, but in the 1930s it certainly was. But this is so different from the regular freeways you drive every day. Big native trees, Art Deco adorned bridges, and a route that follows the curves of the hills rather than cutting straight through them. They don't build them like that anymore. There really is a stark contrast between the Merritt Parkway and Interstate 95 here. This is the story of the near miracle it took to build one of America's first, biggest, most beautiful highways. There are no trucks on this road. And how pretty much every freeway since then has become an ugly, brutalist car moving machine. Once upon a time, the Northeast had like one road. One road for delivering the mail, one road older than the country itself, one road for everybody. Only problem, it was part of every town's main street. The old Boston Post Road, the road running through and between all of Connecticut's historic districts. Which means if you wanted to ship a sofa from New York City to Boston, that sofa went on a truck and that truck went through every single downtown. Out of my way! New York couch coming through! Which wasn't so bad with horse and buggy. But then Henry Ford and his peers helped people start swapping out those horse and buggies for trucks and cars. Lots of them. Back in the 1920s, the federal government paid to pave the road from New York all the way up to Boston. Which made even more people want to use it. Well, they broke pretty much every town in Connecticut. Over 25,000 cars per day were funneling their way through Main Street here in Greenwich, and that was during the Great Depression. Local shoppers during the week mixed with long-distance freight trucks, creating huge traffic jams, especially from the 1920s, on streets from the 1700s that just weren't built for cars. Most of it was a narrow road, just two lanes wide, one in each direction. So state engineers said, well, let's make a bigger road. The state of Connecticut would widen the post road out in the countryside, but you just can't do much in town. The buildings were already there. You could take away on-street parking for more through lanes, but that was pretty unpopular, even in 1927. In some ways, widening the post road in the country made it seem worse when you got to town because now you're funneling even more traffic onto these narrow city streets. And when work ended on Friday night, there was still no relief. And on the weekend, New Yorkers clogging these streets, all going for Sunday drives. What's the deal with all this 1920s traffic? <laughs> Personally, I blame President Harding. Maybe the right answer would be to steer all these pesky out-of-towners away from the towns entirely. Build some type of a highway a few miles inland. Connecticut could build America's first freeway. Or is it? Traffic now backing up on the southbound Hutch through the area. A sharp-eyed New Yorker is going to say, well, now wait a minute, what do you mean Connecticut was first? New York was first. Through hearty immigration and people staying alive because they were actually washing their hands, the city exploded in population. Public works like Central Park helped make the city a little more livable. And as people started moving north along the Bronx River, a new public works project meant transforming the river from an eyesore that would flood out so people would just dump their garbage next to it. The project that would clean all that up, build parks where people would actually want to hang out next to the river. And the biggest public work of all, a road. A really nice road, a parkway. But this is no freeway. The Bronx River Parkway was mostly just a sheet of asphalt that Model T's could drive on. It was a big hit and opened the door for many New Yorkers to buy their first house. So the state started to plan dozens of increasingly advanced parkways. They got a little more complicated with new features as New York learned new things and added them as they built farther and farther north. And it was along their second parkway along the Hutchinson River that the freeway came into its infancy. The Hutchinson River Parkway has freeway-like elements. Off-ramps and on-ramps to control access. Albeit really, really short ones. It has grade separation. Bridges separating cross traffic from the winding highway below. The very feature that makes this seem like it should be the first freeway. But a cruel and short-sighted policy disqualifies the Hutchinson River Parkway. 
A famous city commissioner was afraid that regular people, you know, too poor to afford a motor car, might hop on buses by the thousands and go spoil the beaches in the countryside. So he insisted the bridges be very short, sometimes as low as nine feet tall. That way buses couldn't physically fit underneath them. No buses, only cars. Nine feet tall? Nine feet tall? If I went underneath that bridge and went like this, I could touch the ceiling. I'm sorry, but that's not a freeway. But cruelty to poor people aside, the highway's tight curves and narrow cross-section also detract from its freeway-like qualities. But look at it. At its heart, it's still just a wide road with a concrete center divider. But it was this highway that would make the first freeway necessary. With the state of New York pointing the Hutchinson River Parkway right at Connecticut, planners here thought, oh, maybe we ought to take this threat seriously. Connecticut's post road is a mess. That fact was unanimous in Hartford. In 1927, they agreed that building some kind of inland highway was a good idea. But the Connecticut legislature didn't offer any money to actually build anything. But then, the state of New York had just dumped an almost a freeway onto Connecticut's doorstep. But by 1931, the legislature authorized one million dollars to start buying land. To build something. But what? Leave the design up to the highway commissioner, the Merritt Parkway would have just been another slab of concrete, like the Hutchinson River Parkway, 40 foot wide with a concrete wall in the middle. Excellent for stimulating jobs in the concrete industry, which hadn't been doing too well because of the Great Depression. It was Connecticut's congressman, Skylar Merritt, who suggested, you know, if we're going to build something, let's at least make it pretty. Instead of a single slab of concrete 40 feet wide, two 26 foot wide pieces of concrete separated with a median in the middle. No rigid width. It can get thinner or wider depending on what we want to plant there. While we're at it, save a hearty amount of land off to the sides for even more landscaping. Though it's meant for looking at. No getting out of your car and having a picnic. To win over skeptical neighbors in Fairfield County, the project would be just as much about landscape architecture as it was traffic engineering. This highway was trying to work with the landscape rather than punch its way through it. So occasionally the road gets fairly steep, but never more than an 8% grade, and on average less than a 4% grade. The road commissioner also had brand new technology on his side. Aerial surveillance. Getting up in an airplane, he could see how to route the road through the low spots of the complicated topography. Where road crews had to cut through the hillsides, exposed rock was something to show off, to showcase. And this aligned nicely with the landscape supervisor's plans. Convinced engineers to try to route the road in such a way to save the maximum number of trees as possible. Earl Wood said it was his objective to assist nature in healing the scars of construction. Rather than bringing in foreign plants that were new and exciting, Wood relied on native plants to try to make the roadway blend into its natural environment. And if you don't notice the landscaping, then he's done his job. When a country club cut down a bunch of dogwood trees, he dug them up and brought them here, and it's actually saved the state a lot of money. This gives the Merritt Parkway more of an organic feel to it, a highway that's more art project than it is machine. And designers took that down to the most minute details. Guardrails made of wood instead of metal, for instance. Something Connecticut still maintains today. Or building road signs with this wooden looking zigzaggy sawtooth pattern. The state uses metal signs today, but they do paint that zigzaggy pattern onto the metal signs. And to match the artful concrete on the ground, beautiful concrete in the air. They brought in an architect from Philly named George Dunkelberger. Like George Bailey from It's a Wonderful Life, Dunkelberger dreamed of developing and designing complicated buildings around the world, but the Great Depression happened and he was just looking for work and got a job as a draftman with the Connecticut Highway Department. And then they came to his desk one day with a special assignment. Take their plans for steel arch bridges and figure out a way to slap some concrete on there so they actually look pretty. From an engineering standpoint, these bridges are not that special. So George went out of his way to change that. Each bridge has an artistically distinct design from every other bridge on the parkway. But with a design speed of about 50 miles per hour, it makes it difficult to really slow down and appreciate all the attention to detail each of these bridges has. Dunkelberger may never have had any formal art training, but now 
He's the father of the biggest permanent Art Deco art installation in American history. To save money, the Merritt Parkway only uses one bridge. That creates this pinching effect where the road kind of squeezes together and then fans back out. It's a little bit weird. And money was an issue. In the shadow of how beautiful this road is, we take for granted that it's frankly a miracle that it ever got financed and built in the first place. First, convincing the legislature to spend any money on it at all. Second, dealing with the real estate speculation scandal as criminals started purposely buying up land in the road's path. And then, a bridge started cracking up. More than a few saw the Merritt Parkway, the most expensive public works project in Connecticut's history, as a boondoggle. But in fairness, Connecticut had never built anything like this before. And sometimes on your first try, you make a lot of expensive mistakes. Just ask the state of California, <laughs> right? That's for another video though. How the Merritt Parkway got through all the political wrangling of Hartford and the Connecticut government would be a video in and of itself. It became clear that if the Merritt Parkway was going to reach its full vision, the state of Connecticut was going to have to do something the state of Connecticut didn't want to have to do. Connecticut decided that they needed to charge tolls to pay for it. The first segment, barely open less than a year, saw toll booths go up in 1939, and this very driver pay the very first coin. It was only a dime per car. But so many drivers were using the Merritt Parkway, it brought Hartford over $60,000 per month. And that really helped pay back the $15 million in bonds. But for somebody behind the wheel, that meant pay 10 cents or go back to the traffic on the post road. And if Connecticuters found that irritating, New Yorkers were apoplectic. The local paper even tried to help people cheat the toll. Okay, so before I get to Connecticut, I get off at King Street, I go up to Riversville Road, over to Port Chuck, down Round Hill Road, over to Old Mill, and then I rejoin the parkway. It's almost like the Merritt Parkway was designed to keep people from circumventing the toll booth. By strictly controlling where cars could enter or exit the Merritt Parkway, the designers had laid the groundwork for a principle that governs every freeway, tolled or free, built since then. Normally on a road, you can enter and exit any place you want to. A big street, a side street, a driveway, hop in the curb. But people slowly turning on and off the road well, their driving is just not compatible with the high speeds you hope to get out of a highway like the Merritt Parkway. So all these beautiful features serve a traffic safety purpose as well. The beautiful landscaping prevents driveways and small streets from connecting to the road. That gets rid of that speed conflict of the fast through traffic and the slow turning vehicles. The beautiful median reduces the chance of a head-on crash and prevents U-turns and the gorgeous Art Deco bridges remove that chance of getting in a crash when you cross a big street. The creme de la creme are the ramps themselves that connect the Merritt Parkway to those streets that go over or under a bridge. This model of restricting entry and exit only to the on and off ramps is the key ingredient for every freeway on the planet. And that's what makes the Merritt truly the first freeway. On and off ramps are something that the Merritt steals from the Hutchinson River Parkway and improves on slightly. Entering or exiting the freeway initially had almost no merge space at all, so people would have to almost come to a stop on the freeway to be able to take the ramp. The state of Connecticut's been adding in some merging to make it a little bit better. Beyond safety, new amenities. Engineers realized that motorists weren't going to exit the toll road, get gas, buy their food, and then pay the toll and re-enter. So they introduced service plazas so you wouldn't have to exit the toll zone, you could get gas. The service plaza model worked so well, turnpikes all over the northeast have copied it. But on freeways out west, you typically don't see these. The parkway turned out well. In the first three months the road was open, crashes cut in half, demonstrating how safe a superhighway could be. At the ribbon cutting, Connecticut's governor announced they were going to build many more. It's like the extension of Highway 15, the Wilbur Cross as you get closer to Hartford. So if the Merritt Parkway is so beautiful, how come our freeways today didn't copy it? There's still one problem. There are no trucks on this road. And what's a feature for you and me is not helpful to the people down suffering on the post road. This truck problem would end up having a big influence on how engineers would design the U.S. interstate highway system.
The Merritt Parkway really wasn't designed for big rig trucks. But in 1940, a lot of people were doing things they weren't built to do. A war of complexities in school. The first ever peacetime draft put a lot of men in uniform. And after the attack on Pearl Harbor brought the U.S. fully into the war, the Merritt Parkway got drafted too. During the war, Connecticut dropped the band on trucks. Like in this photo from 1941 that the Merritt Parkway Conservancy found. Military convoys would go back and forth up this thing and just wrecked the pavement. When Connecticut rolled out the red carpet for the 43rd Division of the National Guard on their way to Florida, they still charged the convoy a toll, something the state of New York did not do on the Hutchinson River Parkway when they crossed the state line. Soldiers in World War II, convoy of trucks had to stop to pay a toll on the Barrett Parkway at a toll booth, black and white. <laughs> I don't think that was the standard uniform back then. <laughs> Uh, some Connecticuters worried that all of this was a ruse to keep trucks on the Merritt Parkway permanently. So the minute the war was over, the ban on trucks was back in force. With the Merritt Parkway off limits again, freight was stuck on the old post road. And in a booming post-war economy, that ban just wasn't going to survive long. Not unless big rig trucks got their own road. President Eisenhower's call for a modern controlled access highway system. The House and Senate approved $25 billion to build new freeways. Passage of the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956. A 41,000-mile network of highways from coast to coast, including Interstate 95 through Connecticut. A new superhighway not far from the old post road. But what were these new interstate highways going to be like? If the Merritt is America's first freeway, it was just barely. Chicago built Lakeshore Drive. Roads approaching the Golden Gate Bridge sure functioned a heck of a lot like a freeway. And the Keystone State built the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And this road couldn't be more different than the Merritt Parkway. The road's sole purpose was to get drivers from Pittsburgh to Harrisburg as quickly as possible. No hill too big to flatten, no tunnel too long to build, anything to keep cars and trucks moving and rejuvenate Pennsylvania's struggling economy. So when it came time to build the interstate system, we had a choice. Model it after a machine like the Pennsylvania Turnpike, or make it human in nature, make it fit in with its natural surroundings like the Merritt Parkway. We chose the machine. The great turnpike system has become the grandfather of the gigantic road building program now underway in America. And that is how Interstate 95 here in Norwalk ended up looking no more or less remarkable than any other interstate anywhere else. And at least aesthetically, it's kind of a shame. But imagine for a moment if we built an interstate system that didn't allow any trucks. That would kind of defeat the point of the interstate system. Which was to improve safety for all vehicles, make it easier to mobilize defense, well, that involves convoys of trucks, and boost the economy. Well, you know, that means semi-trucks. Banning them might help make the interstate system more beautiful, but it kind of creates a national post-road problem. Big rig trucks going from the port of Long Beach all the way across the country on little county roads in front of houses through neighborhoods on old main streets. Well, that wouldn't be right. So as I-95 did the heavy lifting, the Merritt Parkway got to stand back and look beautiful until the 1980s when the parkway turned 50. And to celebrate, the state of Connecticut almost gave her a hideous makeover. An idea to widen the parkway from four lanes to eight lanes, which would mean ripping out most of the trees and demolishing every single bridge George Dunkelberger designed. Thankfully, by the 1990s, that idea died off. And it's not to say the Merritt Parkway is a museum. When the road finally paid off all of its tolls, they ripped out all the toll booths. As bridges have aged, the state has replaced them. There's even this. Yeah, I'm no Connecticut historian. This interchange at Main Street and Trumbull really catches my eye. But I'm pretty sure the original Merritt Parkway didn't have a spooey interchange on it. There's a big mall next to this off-ramp, so the state of Connecticut rebuilt the interchange just over 20 years ago to this modern design. Proof they're not afraid to change something in the name of safety and performance, but not to the point where the Merritt Parkway loses its specialness that makes it like pretty much no other road in the country.
As part of my research for this video, I read this book by Bruce Rad. It goes into the history of the Merritt Parkway. The book's published in 1993 called The Merritt Parkway. If you want to learn more and see the uh, neat old photos he's found, uh, I'll put details in the description below where you can find this book. All right, it's cold and my costume doesn't involve a coat, so I'm going to go now. Thanks for watching. As you can tell from the weather, these videos take months to produce, and that's only possible thanks to you and your generous contribution to patreon.com slash roadguyrob, where I eat the profits to stay alive. And I thank you for that.